So before we do that, let's, let's explain some things about what I call functional objects. Uh, functional objects are objects that behave like functions, okay? And this can be interpreted in a variety of ways. In, in basically, a user can sort of call or invoke the object passing arguments and receive a return value, but, but the difference is it's not a function, it's an object that you can pass around. Uh, usually, in C++, it's very common to overload this uh, parenthesis operator. It's been there since the beginning, I think. Um, and uh, uh, one can think about it in a broader sense. It's interesting to, to think about it for a moment. Uh, any method or function, uh, with any method or function, if one of the parameters can be invoked, then that parameter is sort of a functional object. And how many people here know what the template method uh, design pattern is? A few. Okay, I'll, I'll show a very quick example of, of what a template method uh, uh, pattern is. Uh, uh, basically, it's some kind of a virtual, f based on a virtual function. And uh, the real difference, in my opinion, between the template method and, and operator parentheses is, is syntactical. So instead of having uh, um, the uh, um, object passed to a function uh, uh, and then invoke operator parentheses, uh, uh, you sort of have the class derived from your class, and this is how you pass the parameter of what the operation is. I'll show it in a second. Um, I'll, I want to say some, something important. Unlike functions in functional programming, functional objects have a state. Okay, so if it's a class and it has members, these members are the state of an object and every instance can be different, and in many cases you can even assign different values to these members. So this is what I, is called a state. Um, and uh, uh, therefore, if you invoke this operator parenthesis multiple times, you may just receive different outcomes every time. Um, and uh, of course, if the object itself is declared constant, then it doesn't happen. Uh, still, the... Uh, um, the invocation inside, the, the actual code of the operator can change uh, global state or other objects and so on. So it's not quite the concept of, a f of, of functional programming here. There is a state, it can change. It's important to remember. Um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing, why? It's a bad, bad thing. It's a bad it's thing, a bad why? Thing. <laughs> because it's a bug ball. Yeah. It's Generally, I, I can agree. assume something that my colleague did should behave some way, and then. I, I I generally agree. It is it is bug prone in this sense, and I want to say it's important if you ever try to use functional objects, you have to be, again, careful uh, how you use them because it's very easy to get lost uh, when when you start this this type of programming. Uh, I think. Specifically, uh, functional programming languages are not very explanative of what they do. You have one function, you get another function back. Oh well, okay. Uh, uh, so you lose a lot of understanding uh, when, when this happens. I think at least uh, lambdas are const by default. By default, yes, which is a good thing. I'll, I'll talk about <laughs> lambdas. I, I'm not going to talk about mutable lambdas here. It's too much, but uh, yes, it's, it's a good thing. It uh, doesn't help with the reference uh, numbers in const. Uh, you can still modify. Uh, I'm not sure, but. Yeah. So just a word about the, what is called the template method pattern, just so that we are all aligned, and I'll explain how it is sort of functional programming. Uh, let's say that we have some kind of <coughs> algorithm with a run program that is just a. Uh, um, regular, a run method that is just a regular method, and inside uh, there is a call to a virtual method which is called get special data, and you know, we return the square of value, whatever. Uh, and now you can derive from this base algorithm and override the, uh, this method whichever way you want. And you can understand that if you derive it in your own very special way, it is some kind of resembling functional programming, 
okay? Because this, this is now part of the parameters of this run algorithm, okay? Um, so I, I, I want to present it because I think it's, uh, uh, again, sets your mind in, in a bigger context. It's not just about an object with an operator parenthesis, which I have to also say I usually try to avoid such objects with overloaded parentheses. I'll, I'll explain it a little, a little later. Um, but uh, uh, it is, yes, related to, to functional programming in this sense. Uh, so if we go back to our uh, uh, integration task, uh, this is the old fashion. And now we'd, let's define a class which is called integrator. Uh, and let's, f for simplicity, it will take a functional and uh, its operator parenthesis, which is const by the way, okay, uh, will integrate over the uh, integrand from begin to the x parameter here using this uh, step. Okay, so, so this is a generalization of what we saw uh, before. And <coughs> now, we define a template integrate. I, I probably could use the same name, but I prefer just for understanding to, to give it a different name. This function here is now template over the uh, uh, type of the integrand. This integrand has its own operator parenthesis. Has, has its own operator parenthesis, which, which we see here. And, and it's essentially the same algorithm, but now it's templated. So, ah, I don't have the example here, but uh, uh, now you could pass, you know, <coughs> the, uh, um, the integrate function in a way uh, uh, as a class template here to the integrator and, and accomplish the, uh, uh, the double integration uh, task. Okay, so let's summarize the first part. Uh, what did we learn so far? In classical functional programming, everything is a function. And we talked about this and there is no state, there are only objects, constant objects. Uh, we already know from C uh, function pointers, which are the, the simplest form of a, a functional object. Uh, in C++, we have more ways to express the ability to, to... Sorry, one question on the previous slide. Yes. Uh, so, when you pass in the, the integrate function, is it an integrate specific to a functional, like the square or whatever, or, or is it a generic integrate that you pass in? And then how you Here? It? So, it, it, yeah, so let's say that you want to do the double integration, right? Mm -hmm. And you pass in the integrate function. But the integrate yes. function needs to get a function by itself, right? Uh, so yes, so, so you, sorry, you, you pass an integrator, you pass an integrator object. Okay, it already you has some yeah, kind yeah. of square root. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you pass an integrator object, sorry. Okay. You pass an integrator object. And you can, okay, it's a class, everything is... Uh, so it would look like I'm going to do an integrate? Like over an integrate? Over an integrate, over a yes. square? Over, yes, okay. yes, yes, over the integrator of square, yes. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, okay, we have different ways to express our ability to do functional prog or functional like programming. And uh, um, important to remember functional objects are an essential element of generic programming. Um, in, in code template, all the, much of the STL algorithms, for example, use some kind of uh, functional object. Uh, if it's the, uh, um, uh, the uh, find if or, you know. Okay. Predicates. Predicate, and predicate and yes, the, pred the predicate, and yes. And the, the predicate is, is, is a functional object, yes, right. Uh, so, so a lot with, with template, this is one form of generic programming. And Another is with design patterns, which are also some kind of generic programming, uh, like, like the template method uh, uh, pattern. The observer pattern can also use uh, uh, function objects. That if you know the observer, the, the object to which you report of something 
you can make it a functional object. Okay, second part, uh, a little bit about what's there in C11 uh, for functional objects. Again, I suppose some of you are familiar with it, but still worth presenting. Um, so I tried to list all different uh, uh, function object categories. And uh, uh, we start from the function pointers, the global function pointers that might look something like this, uh, which we already saw. Uh, there is another category which I uh, recently began to like, <laughs> which is, which is uh, member function pointers. These are uh, members in a, in a class like this. Uh, um, that uh, uh, you uh, bind to them. I'll explain what bind is very quickly. Uh, you bind to them uh, uh, an instance of this class and then you can invoke them. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it here. You can use what I call a crafted functional class like our integrator from before where you overload the parenthesis operator. Uh, you can use virtual methods as a form of functional programming. And then there is a list of all these, oh, sorry, all these uh, new objects in, in C11, like uh, bind, lambda, and function, which I, I will explain in the uh, coming slides. Um, and I want to start with bind. I don't know how popular it is. Uh, anyone here ever used or liked to use bind? You do. Okay. It's getting less popular. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, um, so but but be behind behind the, the the word bind, like the word lambda, by the way, behind the word bind, th there is some uh, uh, reason that it's chosen. Okay, and um, okay, uh, so first of all, I will explain that the I, I quote it like this: bind is sort of an operator on one functional object and other parameters, which returns another functional object. So I mentioned this in the beginning of the talk, that in functional programming, uh, you have functions that receive functions as, as arguments and can return functions as, as return values. And bind is exactly such an operation. OK, it takes a functional as an object. This is our uh, uh, functional here. And it returns another functional, which is this. This object is a functional object. And the syntax here is something like uh, uh, this is the add function that we know from before. Uh, underscore one is sort of a placeholder uh, that when add 10 is called, uh, it's substituted by the argument that is passed to add 10. And then 10 is the second argument that you pass on to our functional, okay? And uh, I'm not sure if I got the terminology correctly, but uh, by my understanding, add is what is called the bound functional object, and add 10 is the binding functional object. Um, and its operator parenthesis takes one parameter. I'll explain it. Uh, the roots of this do go back to what is known as lambda calculus, which is a theoretical uh, model of computability. I think it was even invented by Turing at the time. Church. Church. By Church? Oh, OK. OK. Um, and uh, um, this is, it's, it's one of these operations that start from, from there. So, so you take one functional, you bind to it another functional, you return a third functional, and et cetera, et cetera. It never ends. Um, I'm not sure I like the syntax. Uh, everybody here, a lot of people here said that uh, it's discouraged. I also found it kind of cryptic. Uh, but still, so even though I'm not <coughs> necessarily going to use it, I think it's worth mentioning at least for the idea of what binding really means. Okay, it means that in a way you are uh, uh, reducing the arity of a function. Uh, you, you start with a function of high dimension and, and you make it a lower dimension uh, function. So is this carrying? Yes. It's what? Carrying. But it's not uh, only one and it's not only the first one. Carrying okay. is like the sprite case. Mm. Okay. Uh, so having mentioned lambda, uh, we all now heard about these lambda objects. And of course, it comes from lambda uh, calculus. 
Uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the new syntax in C++11, I'll show it in a moment. Um, it's what some people like to call syntactic sugar. You could accomplish everything that uh, your lambda expression does by writing a, a simple old class like I presented before. Uh, lambda is, is not really different from a class like that. Um, and uh, um, Actually, but the, the thing is, it's usually easier to use it. It uh, replaces most of the handcrafted uh, overloads. Um, and it does add the bind capability also by the capture. Uh, again, I will show it in a little while. Uh, whether they're called lambda objects, lambdas, lambda is, is the shorter and popular term. Uh, they are abusing the lambda calculus terminology because they are real objects, they can have a mutable, uh, they can mutate global program state inside. So you can write a lambda that, you know, outputs to C out or just adds to some global <laughs> variable or whatever. Uh, you can have a lambda with, that receives a pointer the, and indirects it to do something with it, etc., etc. And they can even have a mutable state of their own, like we mentioned. So it's not, again, it's not <coughs> a real lambda in the sense of lambda calculus, but, you know, it's a catchy name. If, if we keep the, the object immutable, it's very, very close to, uh, um, to the concept of lambda in, in lambda calculus. And you can pass it around, of course, because it's an object. But even if you, it's immutable and uh, it doesn't mutate the global program state, mm -hmm. it's still dependent on things that are not the parameter of the, fu the function, so it's not a really pure function. Of course it's not a function, it's an object. No, I mean, it's n still not a pure function in the uh, mathematics. It term. depends on what you capture and how you use it. So again, if, if you capture some reference no, and, and that reference will change, then of course it can... Even if the call itself doesn't mute it, mutate anything. Yeah, that's what I mean. yeah. If, if you capture a reference uh, uh, and, uh, and then the object behind that reference will change, then yes, it will be mutable in, in that sense as well. Yes. Um, so... Uh, actually, in our uh, conference last month, there was a very good presentation by Andreas Fertisch uh, about lambdas and all kinds of where they come from, where they go, what happens when you do this, what happens when you do this. I, I'm, I'm just going to give a very short uh, uh, explanation. Also, I think that many of you know uh, um <coughs> what, uh, uh, what lambdas are. So uh, this is just a regular function. Uh, this is my own new function, and inside my own function, I define a lambda object, and <coughs> the first part is called capture. This is where I copy, and I, I'm simplifying it deliberately. I, I copy the value of number into the scope of the of the object. Um, there are parameters that look like parameters. Again, I'm simplifying. Look like parameters of of a regular function. Um, there is a function body here, okay, uh, and uh, this is how we finally invoke the lambda. So uh, um <coughs> we captured number here. Uh, we have one parameter which is in this case is going to be five and five, and so the outcome is going to be fifteen. Great. Uh, <laughs> so <coughs> a few things to to bear in mind. Uh, our our capture part here uh, it defines simultaneously both the class members and the constructor of the class. If you remember our, our what I called the crafted uh, uh, functional objects from before, this replaces both the members and the constructor. Uh, body is the function body. Um, parameters define the signature of, of this uh, operator parenthesis. Auto is required because the type of the object, this is an object and the type of the object is something that we don't have access to. Uh, and so our only way of, of holding it as an object, if we want to hold it for a long time, is, is using the auto uh, uh, keyword. And invocation will call this uh, operator um, method, operator parenthesis for this particular object. So is there anyone here who needs more explanation of pandas? Because I think it's now very, very uh, common. Okay? Um, so again, lambdas define classes and instances of the classes at the same time. Um, and it's an object. 
um, <coughs> the capture entities are members in this object. Uh, a lambda object can be copied by value. Uh, it can be moved, which will move all the elements that it captures, or it can be passed by reference objects. Uh, the concrete type of the lambda is inaccessible. Uh, so if you want to pass it to some generic algorithm, you somehow have to abstract the type. And one way to do it is to write the algorithm as a template. Going back here, like this. Okay. And the other way is to wrap our lambda with a std function object. Okay. So having mentioned std function, of course, this is the, the next slide. Um, this is the um, signature of the template class function. Again, I, I'm sure many of you know it. Um, and uh, uh, we can define a type that is a specialization of, uh, uh, of this template class, like this, uh, where it will now have an operator parenthesis that uh, takes double, returns double. Uh, we can in initialize, we can construct this class with many, many, in many, many different ways. And finally, we invoke it like this. Um, one thing to understand about these objects is that every instance can be different, OK? If you define a lambda, it has a class. And um, I guess that it's every instance is, is different by what it captures. But uh, uh, the, um, the actual code of its operator will, go, will be the same. Uh, with std function, you can populate it with any callable object, and any instance can do a completely different thing. Um, and yes, this can be a source of much trouble, because when you use std function, it's even harder to know what it does than with lambdas or things like that. Um, I'll talk about it more later. Uh, it is invocable, the signature of uh, operator parenthesis. I think this is uh, already but understood. But it can capture all the callables. Hmm? It can capture mm -hmm. all the callables. Yes, not capture. I, I, I say it hosts all the callables. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, everything. So not actually except, I think, for a, uh, a scoped for a, a scoped method, because that requires to be bound with a, a pointer to this. an object. Yes. So that's one reason that I wrote most of the above. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, <coughs> so I tried to think, to imagine to myself even how this uh, function object, std function works. I'm, I'm trying to describe it. And again, it's, it sort of helped me when I uh, um, actually tried this thing at, at home, uh, <laughs> some of it. OK. Um, what does it take to construct a std function instance? So this is the, the signature of the constructor. It's templated over essentially anything takes it essentially by value. This is the, the object f, and somehow it has to host it. Um, what the, how does it work? First, we need to allocate memory okay, for our internally hosted instance, as much as needed. Uh, we need to construct uh, an instance of this uh, uh, class, either by copy or by move. <coughs> that instance is, is itself moved into the allocated memory, sort of an, an in-place uh, move construction. OK? And we also have to keep pointers to all different control functions. Uh, we, need a, we need to keep a pointer to the copy constructor, because if we want to copy the uh, std function object, we also have to copy the content. Um, by the way, what about move? If we want to move the std function, Okay. Yeah, but what, how does how will that how will that work? Anonymous Not no internally. You have a, a, a stood function. You have a stood function object, and now you move it into another stood function object. What happens inside? Copy the inside the pointer to the actual memory where the object resides, or to copy it. Unless the object is actually in the object of the function object itself, and then the whole object will be. 
Well, if if you already allocated here and, and, and you, you yeah, cannot you really do it, if you already and, and you cannot really <laughs> do it without in in almost any case you cannot do it without allocating the memory. Almost uh, any case. Usually, the function they provide the small buffer inside, so for small objects they usually provide okay. small mm -hmm. object uh, optimization. Okay. So this is my <laughs> expert to call when I <laughs> no okay. But in in principle, you could just move this thing. And, and, and you could keep even these guys with this dynamically allocated memory, so you, so you, you just have to move this guy and nothing more. Um, but you need the copy constructor, you need to know what the destructor is, uh, you need to know the address of uh, operator parentheses, so it's going to be expensive to construct this std function object. And it's important to remember. You said, well, it's the first thing I think about, but it's good that you think about it, but it's not so obvious. It's very easy to try to pass such an object by value. Uh, and very recently, uh, I actually switched from using std function to something more concrete like the member function because I didn't want to copy it over and over again. I, I, I had no better way of doing it. You can also pass it by const, right? No, because this object stands by itself. Even if your original callable object is destroyed, this thing still has to work. Yeah, but if you're calling the function in scope, passing as soon as you pass anything by uh, points to reference, it's yeah. But usu usually, usually when you work, usually when you work with an, with a std function object, you want to re retain it somewhere else. That's that's the usual case. You want to return it some, somewhere. Not necessarily, it would be just for code clarity, so not to have a big. Uh, okay, that. okay, but still there is a price to pay there. I, I can say some more maybe later. Maybe we give a talk about type erasure. <laughs> uh, maybe. This is the important. It is term. type. It is type erasure. Yes, exactly. it is. Yes, yes. Can you explain why the why we need to move twice the? the well, I don't really know, but I uh, just saw that it happens. <laughs> I checked it. <laughs> Why, what? Hmm? Why, what? Why it has to be moved twice? Uh, I think the reason has to do more with the internal design. So, so actually, it's, uh, probably this allocation is done later. I think what I suspect that what really happens is first there is a construction of an instance outside of uh, uh, of uh, the, the this memory. Uh, it can fail, it can throw an exception, etc., etc. You probably don't want to allocate a memory before you could even get hold of, of this object. So if anything here fails, you, you, you don't even go here. Uh, and then, once it is constructed under your control, you can move it. I think that's the, that's the reason behind it, but again, I, I didn't, other than knowing that it happens, uh, uh, I didn't check any, any deeper. Uh, but yes, I did check this. Um, so it's an expensive object, it's heavy size, still it's relatively cheap, relatively cheap to invoke the, the um, operator parenthesis because you already have a function pointer to it. It's and a virtual, it's usually a virtual function, uh, one way to implement it. One version. way, but you, you can really keep a pointer to the operator parenthesis, okay, um, a, you know, scope okay. pointer or so. Um, uh, this is type erased. Uh, so the content and the actual function code cannot be predicted before the construction or deduced after the construction. Uh, you, you, it's, it's, a ba it's a black box. You know, there is nothing you can say. And interestingly, some things are impossible. Can, can you uh, think about this for a second? You lose the yeah, you get the, the slicing. You're losing. What? You losing the virtual function. The slicing. slicing so down. first of all, I, I, I can say uh, these two classes have different size, and this guy here doesn't really know if what it's receiving is A or B, so it doesn't even know how much memory uh, it needs to allocate for this uh, um, stored copy. Okay. 
Uh, and you probably lose the, the virtual table. I, again, I didn't check this very deeply, but uh, you realize that there is a virtual call here and, and something gets lost on the way. So I did try this code and it really doesn't work. Uh, but uh, but I didn't in investigate. Uh, so it would have happened if you would have copied the object. No, if you if you copy if if you copy if you copy, then you know the concrete type here. If you pass by value, then you know the concrete type here. So it's a different situation. No, oh, if you still get a by const ref and you make a copy inside the simple copy. The auto oh, if you, you just copy if, if, you, if you if you copy it explicitly. Yes. If you copy it explicitly, then yes, it will, it will be the concrete type. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Um, so let's uh, uh, summarize this, this part of the talk. Uh, in C++11, we have several types and syntaxes to simplify the definition. I, I, I don't know, maybe bind is earlier than 11. Do you remember? Yeah, if it was in boost. Yeah, boost had yeah. for in, no, in this I'm talking about form. there was bind one, bind two, and yes. so on. This, mm. this, this one okay. makes variety templates. It okay, so <laughs> it's still ugly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we we identified uh, some of the newer uh, ways to to create functional objects. They really are objects. Lambdas, in some cases, can be simpler. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going into all the details, but sometimes lambda, lambda can be reduced into a, a global function pointer. Uh, there is another thing here which uh, is sort of known, that if you write a generic algorithm as a template and pass in a lambda, in many cases, it's going to be much more efficient than if you write it uh, by passing a function object, even if it's by reference, uh, because it can specialize the algorithm much more efficiently. So, can optimize. yeah. Then yeah. Mm -hmm. then it the yeah, yes, yes, at least in some cases, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can try. Yeah, sometimes it, it, can, it can inline it and, and, and reduce it to the final value, yeah. but that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, um, <coughs> they loosely represent uh, functionality in, in the FP paradigm. Again, it's, <coughs> it's, I'm, I'm being very careful here. I, I don't call this functional programming because all these side effects. Um, and uh, uh, another thing, even STD function as an object, it can be reassigned and, and you know, its content can be completely replaced as an object. So it's a very, very, you know, have, have to be careful with it. Uh, and using them has benefits and prices. So uh, I want to present some conclusions that I have with my uh, one and a half year of <laughs> I'm, I'm just about to finish. Uh, one and a half year of using these things. Um, First, this is a rule from Clang Tidy, prefer lambda to stood by, and I think we already covered. Um, I usually also prefer lambda to handcrafted classes with this uh, operator parentheses. They, they simplify your life, and uh, there will always be cases where you need such an object, but usually I prefer not to even overload it to have a named method. I think it's much clearer. Um, should I choose, you know, if I have a generic algorithm, should I choose lambda or should I choose STD function, so we already said uh, um, <coughs> with Lambda, usually you have to write the algorithm as a template, then it means that uh, you expose your uh, intrinsic code. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not so good. Um, it's going to be many times more efficient. Uh, stood function is type erased and it has better abstraction, but it has some cost of performance. So, you know, you can choose this, choose this, know what you choose. Um, <coughs> refrain from nested lambdas. How many of you have ever seen a nested lambda? Okay, I hate nested lambdas. Sorry <laughs> to tell you guys. Uh, it's so, try not. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's a terrible obfuscation and, and, and usually by some, you know, technique you can um, refactor them into a method. I think in the usual case, this is the right thing to do. Um, or in some cases, you can create two separate lambdas and then move the inner one into the uh, into the outer one. It's another technique which, at, at least you, you you in front of your eyes, you, it looks better. 
Um, capture with consideration. Uh, I think Andreas uh, Fertisch uh, said much more about this. Um, reduce copy or pass by value of callable objects. So, you know, it has some performance price. And finally, does it does it take uh, everything around or just the things that the lambda actually uses? Uh, uh, this thing, yeah, the the uh, the everything capture everything. Um, it's not just about the size, really, but it can have all kinds of funny side effects. So uh, the size is is basically anything that was declared up to that point. Uh, but only the stuff it actually uses. Yeah. Uh, again, yes, but. So but sometimes, sometimes you accidentally use something that you didn't want to use. So you you, 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 you should check Andreas Fertisch's presentation because he, he actually talks about this. Uh, and I have two minutes. Uh, so one more thing to say. Uh, choose wisely between uh, functional objects and plain old polymorphism. And uh, uh, I'm, again, I'm being very, very careful when I, even this very day, okay, I switched from stood function to polymorphic types. Uh, uh, there are some, so to say, rules of thumb, uh, but usually with polymorphic types, you know better what you get than, than if you use uh, uh, something like a, a, a callable object. Um, if, uh, um, if you have a collection of functions, and this is something that happened to me two days ago, uh, if you have a collection of functional objects with equal captures, or common content, uh, like they have it, the, the, the function body has a, a part that repeats over and over again, it's probably better designed as, as a real class instead of as a collection of, of uh, uh, callable objects. Uh, because then you can extract this part out into another method, uh, you can capture everything in one object, so, you know, 